and Crow. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to uh, another episode of American Psycho. <laughs> Thank you. I just got nudged. Somebody reminded me where the hell I am, who I am, and what the name of the show is, because apparently I didn't know before now. Uh, so, yeah, we are actually here on the... Uh, uh, the I guess mid-season finale of American Psycho, and I want to thank you all for tuning in and listening, being uh, faithful compatriots. Uh, I rely upon you, and I thank you so much for your listenership. Uh, We are going to wrap this show up with a really cool guest. He's actually calling in all the way from uh, Toronto, Canada, because there are so many other Torontos to choose from. Uh, Everybody, please welcome Mr. Nolan Randall. Nolan, you out there? Oh, yeah, for sure. You know it. I'm so glad to hear that because if you weren't, I was going to completely freak out more than usual. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, Nolan, uh, you are the primary singer, songwriter, contributor uh, for a band called Plaid on Flannel. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct. So, tell me about that. I mean, uh, so how long have you been playing music for? Been playing music for almost 12 years. Been singing for probably 10 years, and uh, was in a few bands growing up, and did the old uh, band thing. Yeah. Went to college. I was in a metal Uh-oh. band in Ottawa, alternative band in Peterborough. So wait a minute. Let's then... slow down. Metal band in <laughs> Ottawa. So tell me about that for a moment. Uh, they were called the Scarecrows. Scarecrows with a Z on the end. Uh, we say Z in Canada, but uh, yes, you, guys you say do, Z. and it throws the rest of us off. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I was in this metal band, and it was cool. We played. Uh, we played a couple gigs, and uh, I liked the energy there. Yeah. But then I moved back to Peterborough, where I'm from, and then uh, which is between Toronto and Ottawa. Mm-hmm. And then I joined an alternative band called Three Short. And it was a short-lived band, but one summer with that band. And then I joined another band called High Waters Band with guys that were 20 years older than me. Uh-oh. And we played, yeah, we played about 89 gigs over two and a half years. Wow. Got a lot of experience. And over that time, I was doing plaid on flannel as well. Well, so, so I started. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. I started Flat on Flannel in 2011, like the summer 2011. Recorded my first album, Fairburn Meadows, with 12 tracks. And then after that, I did Mission of Mercy, the newest album, with 20 tracks. I did one of those two, but I called it Marriage Number Two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, now I'm here in Toronto studying music at Centennial College, looking to go on to the next step of my career, really. All right. So so, uh, Centennial College, tell me, I mean, um, in terms of studying music, I mean, is it a broad-based sort of uh, open theory kind of thing? Uh, Is it a single instrument sort of focus? Uh, What's... uh what is Centennial yeah, well, College about? I'm, uh, I'm majoring in guitar. It's this brand new program that just started this year. Kind of joined it last minute. And it covers pretty much everything, like musical theory, the business side, the uh, electronic production side of it, engineering, mm-hmm. and um, everything in between, really, the performance. There's a big emphasis on performance, which is cool, because I've performed a lot in the last couple of months in and around Toronto. So, yeah, just about everything in that program. So it was cool to just join something that just covered all that because I truly love everything about music. and Totally. Like no, to let's, let's, uh, let's actually go ahead and geek out about that because I did uh, um, uh, a ways back, I did uh, the year-long program at a Musicians Institute in Hollywood uh, where I had teachers Ooh. like, you know, Paul Gilbert. And I was in uh, classes with uh, a guy who will just currently go by the name Satchel is the guitar player player in uh, uh, Steel Panther, and um, yeah, so being involved in something like that where you are literally living and breathing music every single day, that is your primary focus, that's a huge growth experience, right? Oh yeah, it's it's all what I've always wanted, you know, I just live and breathe music as it is, so mm-hmm. I just, uh, just want to do this every day of my life, all day, every day. I hear that. So, um, <laughs> so, um, 
Well, let's talk about this. What kind of what kind of brought you to music? Was was there a I don't know, sort of like a thank you for making the noise in the background, Troy. We really appreciate that. In fact, if we could just have some more of the XI Radio staff come in here and make some incredibly unprofessional noise, that would be incredibly exciting for the listeners out there across <laughs> the world going, "What the fuck is going on over there?" <laughs> Um, and scene. Um, so uh, wh- where was the moment? Uh, what happened for you that you said, oh, my God, I really I want to play music. I want to be a guitar player. Well, it was actually it was Nirvana. Really? I, and I got into Nirvana 10 years after they were mainstream and big, big time. Uh huh. Oh, two. I got into Nevermind by Nirvana. OK. And just played the album. I probably still know every word to that album. And uh, Pearl Jam and Soundgarden. It was the grunge bands that really brought me in. And I started playing guitar. And then it was classic rock like ACDC, okay. uh, The Doors, Black Sabbath. Thin Lizzy, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin. So I just started going all over. <clears throat> Between uh, 2002 and 2005, I was into the classic stuff, the older stuff. Uh huh. And then later on, I got into indie rock. About 06, 07, I was into uh, Arctic Monkeys and uh, Vampire Weekend, Arcade Fire. So I've I've listened to a lot of indie rock, and that kind of put a modern twist on it for me because I listened sure. to all the old stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And then I got into the newer stuff, sort of. No, not all of it, of course. Like I don't love all new music, but there's a select bit I do love, and it, I am influenced by it, like the Black Keys and Wolf Mother. I was gonna say, so but, I mean, like Wolf Mother. You t- to me, Wolf Mother is what happened if you took uh, if Deep Purple and Black Sabbath had kids, you would have Wolf Mother. <laughs> Yeah, and probably Led Zeppelin was in on the threesome there. Sure, yeah, exactly. Um, they might have just been <laughs> handing out the condoms, but they were in the room, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Wolf Mother was the biggest influence on what I'm doing here, I, I got to say. Okay. Andrew Stockdale. Um, I, Wolf Mother made perfect sense to me when I when I first listened to them in 2006, I think. And that kind of... That kind of gave me ideas on what I wanted to do so because me, I have this kind of voice that's uh-huh. similar to his. Well, let me ask you because, I mean, I, I honestly don't know. What happened to Wolf Mother? Because they were sort of there for a moment and they seemed to be like really kind of making some waves. And then sort of like Kaiser Sose, poof, they were gone. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> usual suspects. Exactly. Right? So, like <laughs> um, so, any uh, idea what happened? Yeah, they, they, were, they're, they actually broke up, but uh, they came up with an album in 2009 called Cosmic Egg okay. which was also a great album not as publicized as their first album Clearly. I loved it I listened to it a lot and I was like why Why the hell aren't these guys massive like why aren't these guys like the biggest band in the world Man, and I think if, uh, if I had a nickel for every time might, I heard a band I and I was like what? how, how come yeah I hear you I'm sorry. And then so Andrew saying? Stockdale, lead singer, had a solo album come out this year. Yeah. Called Keep Moving. Okay. And I'm still being influenced by his music to this day. You know, I, I got that album and it was cool. It was, the album's called Keep Moving. So I, I knew in my mind I needed to keep moving in my music career. And that brought me to Toronto. Gotcha. From okay. From Peterborough. <laughs> So um, I will ask you this, because in terms of how you're talking about um, sort of what you latched on to uh, being sort of the, the, the grunge era and then getting back into the uh, older, more, quote, classic stuff. And I actually I kind of hate that title because it, 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 I don't know, it makes it sound like it's old and somehow irrelevant. And actually, I think it's always incredibly relevant. Um, but there's a gap in yes. there. Was there any of this stuff in the 80s? I mean, there was, you know, the whole hair metal thing. You get bands like Rat and Mob. Motley Crue and, of course, Van Halen and stuff like that. Did any of that ever, ever speak to you? Yes, actually, you know what? I should have put Van Halen in the mix of the uh, the, the quote-unquote classic artists I mm-hmm. listen to. And Motley Crue, of course. Yeah, I'm a big fan of their work. Uh, down-tuned guitars. Right. I started getting into that when I got into metal. Mm-hmm. Um, big fan of Metallica. I got into them in uh, the 2006. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm kind of all over the place. You know, I like the 80s. Um, I I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the uh, the electronic. I, I do like electronic, but I like the heavy sound of guitars, which is why I, I stick stuck to the, uh, the guitar-based bands like Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses. No, and all those I, I, I agree. I mean, I've always um, I've always liked 
some of the interesting rhythmic things that can go on electronically. I mean, you go all the way back to bands like, um, I don't even know it's a band, but you take uh, groups like Tangerine Dream or Kraftwerk yes. and sort of like, I mean, really, you, you go back to the roots of that. In fact, even uh, you take a listen to Gary Newman and stuff like that and how that is actually, I mean, if you, you can't possibly, at least I don't think, listen to Gary Newman on uh, a, a track like Cars and then fast forward to Nine Inch Nails with Closer and the same kind of arrangement with the kind of uh, musical breakdown at the end and not draw, connect the dots that if we're not for Gary Newman and Cars, you probably wouldn't have Nine Inch Nails and Closer. Yeah, or, or Depeche Mode. It won't work for Depeche Mode as well. And Depressed Mode. Depressed Mode. Depressed Mode. <laughs> <laughs> or... Uh, New Order, right? A couple of those bands, yeah. I like, and I also like progressive rock, like uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, uh-huh. and Genesis. Yes. All right, so I'm going to throw a complete left wing. So as you're talking about prog- uh, number one, uh, any thoughts about Marillion? Marillion? Yeah. Um, what's? I'm sorry, I'm That's not okay. sure what yeah, that is. Uh, Marillion was a band out of the UK. Um, they had huge success actually uh, overseas. They had minimal success in the US, um, specifically with. Uh, they had one hit called Kaylee, um, and that one is very near and dear to my heart. So much so that I, I named my daughter Kaylee. Um, really? Yeah. Um, but uh, they were very, um, very Genesis. Uh, in fact, a lot of people accused their singer Fish of being a Peter Gabriel uh, clone. Yeah. And there are some times that I've heard it, but uh, not so much. But uh, since you mentioned, mentioned prog rock, I, I figured I would ask. But then also, um, uh, are you familiar with Eddie Jobson? Eddie Jobson. That's, that's another name I, I'm not familiar with. Welcome I'm to sorry. school. <laughs> <laughs> So Eddie Jobson, he was actually the keyboard and uh, violin player for UK, and it was him and John Wetton on uh, uh, bass and vocals and Terry Bozio on drums. Some, I mean, just very, very, uh, it, they put the capital P in progressive. Um, so really? That, yeah, and, and Eddie Jobson did... Um, he was uh, he he did a solo record called Zinc that uh, you gotta go look at and find or I'll find a way to send you some files some really just incredibly he actually was really kind of leaning close to sort of a great blend between that very progressive kind of sound and yet it was kind of hooky and kind of poppy at the same time it was almost confusing um, yeah but um, yeah that would be that would be something to check out. Oh yeah, I'm writing all this down for sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely uh, Jobson and Zinc, Morillion. Got Marillion, it all yeah. written down. Um, so, in terms of guitar players, um, who were some of the guys that uh, uh, that that really spoke to you? And well, surely we're going to play some of your music, and so you're going to be tested. <laughs> okay. Well, obviously Hendrix. Ultimate. Sure. And uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan. For yes. Sure. Like, so I like I, I like my philosophy on guitar playing is I'm not trying to be really fast or trying to be really strong. I'm trying to be with something in between. I'm trying to play for strength and for speed. Yeah, I got and you. With, and I use thicker strings on my guitar. I heard you were a musician, so I figured I'd talk about uh, guitar. Absolutely. No, we can so, we can geek out thoroughly. We're gonna get into gear in a moment, just because why the <laughs> fuck not? <laughs> Yeah, so Stevie Ray Vaughan, obviously his strings were very, very heavy, yeah. very uh, meaty. That guy, from what I understood, and this freaked me out because I'm like, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I, I've played for years and I consider myself a decent player, but uh, I am certainly more into the lighter, slinkier strings. And I always heard that Stevie Ray would play with these really heavy strings. And not only were they heavy strings, which for those of you out there that don't play, are a lot harder to sort of get your hands on, but he would also play with a much, much higher action off of the neck. And once again, if you're not a guitar player out there, it makes it a lot harder to play. And that guy apparently was sort of like, if you found, what are all the things that every other guitar player would say would make it impossible to play? He went, oh, I'll do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the action is kind of like a dobro thing. Eh? Yeah. Like, uh, it would be good for slide guitar. I know the few of his slide songs are awesome. I, I know if I was to ever have the action like him, I would use a, I would use it for slide work. 
I, I but never you, actually playing. <laughs> now I have uh, I have I've made one or two attempts to to try to actually play slide, and I don't do it well. And I probably should just try more and get it because I've got friends who uh, uh, Billy Rowe from the band Jet Boy has become an amazing slide player, and I try to do it, and I just I I slide out of out of tune is where I slide. It's just, yeah, it's just bad. Similar kind of thing. Uh, um, are you a fan of Gary Moore? Gary Moore, yeah. It's, um, you know, I'm not. I don't know a lot of his stuff, but I've obviously uh, heard of his stuff and uh, seen a little bit of that. Certainly, I mean, but, he, uh, he, I mean, he cut his teeth as one of the original guitar players in Thin Lizzy, and he was another one of those guys who would use really heavy strings with a, an unbelievably high action, and that guy just feel and soul and heart for days. And then he when played he, a Les Paul, right? Yep. Yeah, for sure. And when he wanted to, he could just rip like a beast. You'd be going, oh my god, this, I'm gonna go home now and just good practice yeah for sure yeah uh thin lizzy stuff is just amazing i like well they had another guitarist too right they had the uh kind of the dual guitar thing going on with yep. the uh, harmonies which i love that was that was very influential for artists like metallica uh-huh. and uh, iron maiden yep definitely sure. No, I mean definitely. You can you can uh, easily draw a connect the dots from uh, from like Thin Lizzy to Judas Priest to Iron Maiden to an extent early Thin Lizzy. I mean there was definitely uh, excuse me early Def Leppard. Um, uh, th- yeah, I mean that that sort of two guitar thing. And how do you how do you take the music and you orchestrate it so that it's not just two guys playing the same thing constantly? It's like well we got we got twice as many notes as we had a minute ago. What do we do? Yeah. Well, uh, I saw Iron Maiden last year. Really? They have, they have the three lead guitarists, and they yes. could all shred like crazy. It, uh-huh. it was just insane. It was like you couldn't decide who was the best guitar player in the band. It was just ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, and, and at that point, no need to. I mean, I know that, I mean, for me, um, I mean, I love Dave Murray, and I can't pronounce the name of the other guy because he came in a little bit later. There was a period of time when Bruce Dickinson left the band. But for me, Adrian Smith in, in Iron Maiden, he, always, he had a melodic sense that just completely just hit me in a way that neither one of the other guys did. But that's, you know, that's one man's opinion. Yeah. Oh, well, he had a lot to do with the song the writing yeah. and composing as well. So. Mm-hmm. To give him respect for that. You know what? I, here's the thing that blew my mind, and I, I've never been able to confirm this, but what I'd heard is that Bruce Dickinson, aside from flying the plane for the band, um, <laughs> he actually warms up for their shows by roller skating in the parking lot outside of the venue, and he <laughs> sings the entire set roller skating so that he's working, he's just getting in an aerobic workout, but so that when he's running around the stage, He's totally got the breath to sing the way he sings. And that guy today, he's still, uh, he's one of the greatest singers in, in rock ever. Yes. Oh, but, yes. I, I totally agree with you there. But uh, you, and, you, you hear something like that. It's like, yeah, I can see that guy in a parking lot on roller skates. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can picture that. I have to see that to believe it, really. Yeah, I, I would actually, and like I say, it's something that I heard. I've never been able to get it confirmed. But um, I don't know. You watch that guy run around a stage and you go, and I, I I've always watched him and go, how does that guy never run out of breath? Yeah, but um, <laughs> that would be how. So, um, yeah, he's superhuman, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah probably. Um, so what about, okay, so you get into, um, I don't know, I guess sort of the, the more typical guitar hero kind of names, etc. Guys like uh, Steve Vai or, or Joe Satriani. Um, the thoughts or feelings on guys like that? Yes, I I do like I do like those guys. I I read about them a lot in uh, mm-hmm. guitar magazines and all that. But um, they were more of an instrumental kind of guitarist. Right. I like. Uh, I don't know. I guess I like the guitarists that are in the bands that have the singers and they songwrite and everything. I like. I like kind of the all right, all round guitarists. I hear you. But I do love those guys. And you mentioned Paul Gilbert earlier. You said yeah. you were. You were associated with him? Uh, I got to, uh, he was one of the teachers at, at GIT when I went there. And that guy, that guy used to just absolutely kill me because you would you would go into like these dinky rooms and he would play this chord progression and then he'd go, oh yeah, it's this Beatles song backwards. 
<laughs> and he'd be like, this song, he goes, this song is great. He'd play it and he goes, yeah, it's Eleanor Rigby backwards. And you'd go, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> he put his own twist on it or something. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, but that was, and so it actually blew because at the time he was more known for stuff like Racer X and things like that. And then to hear that what he really cared about was the Beatles and Todd Rundgren. And he was really into 70s pop rock. He, all that guy really cared about was hooks. But then if you carry that forward and you think about, well, how much did he write for Mr. Big? And, you know, the, the fact that he really was a, a pop songwriter. He just could happen to play a guitar with an electric drill with picks on the end was sort of an (laughs) add-on. Yeah. Well, I I like that. That that is cool. That is a nice, diverse way to uh, jump into the musicality of everything. That's that's cool. So let's do this. Um, Let's uh, let's dive into a a piece of your music, and we can go into some more um, music and guitar-oriented talk, so that we try not to completely. People are going, "We don't play guitar, do we? Really want to hear this?" (laughs) Um, So we're gonna play a track of yours. Um, Again, the band is called Plaid on Flannel, Um, and uh, this is a song. I I believe this is uh, the initial release off of uh, uh, your your current working. Uh, This is a track called competition yes it is and uh so let's uh, let's play this and uh we will come back in a few minutes and and talk a bit more so everybody once again this is uh nolan randall this is his band plaid on flannel the track is called competition check this out and uh we will back and be back shortly uh with some more american psycho
Mods, your source for new, used, and vintage equipment. Bearing acoustic, electric, guitars, bass, amps, banjos, mandolins, accessories, apparel, books, and memorabilia. With popular brands from Dan Electro, D, Delta, Epiphone, Fender, Gibson, Wretch, Hill, Hoffner, Martin, Mernick, Olympia, Rickenbacker, Roland, Steel, Taylor, and Drew Joe. Visit normansrareguitars.com or stop by our Tarzana location at 18969 Ventura Boulevard. The pro shop here, you should too. Norman's Rare Guitars. Welcome back to American Psycho. We are on with uh, Mr. Nolan Randall from the Bad Plaid on Flannel, calling in all the way from Toronto, Canada. Am I right there? Yes, you are correct. All right, so we're going to take a brief uh, hard left turn uh, before we get back to uh, music and uh, actual relevant talk. But I just I have to ask this because it's in the news, and I'm going to ask you the bold and blatant question that I think a lot of listeners out there probably across the planet are, are asking themselves. Nolan, what the fuck is up with your mayor? <laughs> I honestly don't. I, I don't. I don't get into it too much, but yeah, I think there's a lot up with him. But they're saying that he's probably going to get voted in again because of this this whole thing. Really? And everybody's saying now that he's so honest in everything, but he denied the allegations for months. Like this story's been going on for almost a year now, right? So uh, I remember it was probably like in the spring or maybe the winter last like that we just passed. That this whole thing came up, and they had a video of him smoking crack or whatever. <laughs> so he denies it, and then all of a sudden, like a couple weeks ago, the cops say they have they have the video and everything, and all of a sudden, he admits to it. And then yesterday, I think it was yesterday, he was being interviewed, and he talked about he had this weird oral sex reference in <laughs> yeah, inter- and. <laughs> Obviously, all, all the social media was exploding after that happened. But uh, I don't know. Some people are, uh, from what I see online, some people have mad respect for him. And they think he's cool or something. I don't know. But I, I actually I guess find that's that politics. confusing. <laughs> It's sort of like going, you know, it's, I, I'm really, I'm so happy that my elected official has admitted that he's an absolute junkie. Gee, I think I'll vote for him again because his willingness to be honest, the fact that his decision making is bad, means I should allow him more decision making. <laughs> and on Jimmy Kimmel, I think it was last night or something, they, uh, they talked about that and how he... Uh, how he said he got kicked out of the Air Canada Center in Toronto in 2006 for being too drunk or something. <laughs> and uh, so so they, he's, he promised he'd never do that again. And somebody was talking to him in one of these court hearings or something and said, you promised you'd never, you'd never act up again or something. It's like, exactly. I promised I would never be drunk in the Air Canada Center again. And that hasn't happened yet. He's doing other stuff elsewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know what? Nothing like a politician to find like the one way to slightly spin uh, the one sense. Go well. I didn't say I wouldn't do this. Yeah. <laughs> so now he can now he can smoke peyote and then exactly. say, hey, I, like you know, I was I was like Hunter S. Thompson on on some trip, but I never <laughs> said that I would do that. You know, I said I wouldn't smoke crack anymore. So I don't know. He's probably moving on to the next thing, and he'll get elected into office again. And uh, that's I don't know. Are, are we a laughing stock to you guys, or what's going on down there? Well, no. I mean, uh, I wouldn't say that you guys are a laughing stock to us because we're certainly no less guilty. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, it would be, in fact, I think it would be the height of hypocrisy uh, for Americans to somehow point at your mayor and go, oh, look at those guys up in Canada. Ugh. Oh, yeah, because all of our elected officials are so innocent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Next. Uh, like Elliot, Elliot Spitzer in uh, the New yeah. York governor. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Anthony Weiner. And oh, I mean, gee, you know, the list goes on and on. Yeah, no, I, it's, um, but um, I think if anything, at least, you know what I would actually hope, what I would really, really hope is that there's a point where, um, you know, American citizens that are seeing what's going on uh, with your mayor and and his brother is sort of an odd, weird twin accomplice, um, that what we could actually do is come together, lock arms and go, let's take out politicians. 
just <laughs> yeah. These maybe these fuckers are weird, and um, how they got to the place of power, um, I, you know, don't think I can necessarily figure out. But uh, somehow they got there. Uh, but they're more. Uh, if anything, I, I think it almost makes the rest of us feel better about ourselves because, a, as difficult and as odd and weird as and broken as we may all feel at times in our lives, to find out that the, that the mayor of a large city is far more fucked up than you are kind of makes you feel good in the morning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It makes you, it makes you feel good about yourself. Exactly. Sure. Look, my thing is I go to Starbucks too often. Um, if I'm shaky, it's because one too many lattes, but that's about it. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're, you're fine. You're, you'll be all right. <laughs> well, we'll see about that. Let's not rush to judgment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get back to the much more important stuff, the things that really, really matter, and that is, um, so, uh, so plaid on flannel. Where does it? That's an interesting name. Um, it's easy. I mean, I, as a guy who does comedy, my first thought is, oh, is that like a, a lesbian encounter group? Is that like, <laughs> you know, uh, like the Nirvana Pearl Jam club meet? What is that? But for you, where did the name plaid on flannel come from? Uh, well, there was no lesbian thoughts at all in that name. But uh, I like Pearl the way you qualify that you, in you that got name. <laughs> I had a radio show when I was in college at in Ottawa called Dirty Flannel Jacket. Okay. And we played a lot of uh, we played a lot of grunge music. It was an internet radio station. We didn't have a lot of listeners, but we had a good time. There were a couple friends and me. I know what that's so, like. So, uh, so yeah, and then uh, I came up with that in late 2010 after I finished school. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was just, I don't know, it was, it was something that kind of rings, I don't know, flat on flannel. And I know that uh, most bands say, you know, the, the name doesn't matter, it's just a name or whatever. Like, oh, rolling... not true, not true. No, not true, you don't think so? No, I think name's totally important. I think, I'm okay, so uh, for example, um, take, take, take an iconic band like Kiss. And you go back to their previous name, which was what? Uh, Dirty Lester. Dirty Lester. Yeah. Um, that was uh, the, the, the band that they were, they were, they were called Dirty Lester. And uh, go ahead and think about just the whole Kiss name, the show, the brand or anything. And think about it with the name Dirty Lester and tell me that it works for you the same way. Dirty Lester? I don't know. It, it would be different if it, if it went through like that. Maybe... Uh... Maybe it would grow on you. I know, like Led Zeppelin was a, was a joke when they named that band. Right. But he, and uh... <laughs> here's another thing I remember that that's something that that becomes. I mean, with a band name, and I know that this this sort of gets into something a little bit more materialistic, and it's a little bit more branding and all of that. But you know, there's something about having a name of a band that sort of rolls off the tongue, and something that you can chant actually makes a difference. You know, uh, you, you take a band like Iron Maiden, you know, you can chant, you can yell Iron Maiden or just Maiden, something like that. Yeah. You know, you can chant Kiss. I know that, uh, uh, and again, I, I am a huge uh, Nine Inch Nails and, and Trent Reznor fan. And I know that he talked about, I mean, he picked Nine Inch Nails um, not only because he thought the name sounded cool, that it was chantable, and he could come up with a logo that looked cool. And these are all very aesthetic things. So I... I, I I don't think there's anything wrong in coming up with the name of a band that has an aesthetic appeal that actually yeah. strikes you in a way that, you know. So do you think Plaid on Flannel has an aesthetic appeal? Actually, I do. In fact, I think it's incredible. I mean, to me, there's, you know, the idea, of, typically when I think of Plaid and I think of Flannel, I think of synonymous. And so you've immediately got a, there's a connect the dots thing there. And it's like, well, what does that visually look like? I mean, the, uh, no, I think it's, uh, it actually it makes you think. I, I, I totally dig it. Yeah. And it's also a reference to the amount of influences I do have. Mm-hmm. And I forgot to mention Rush earlier. Well, um, we're going to get to that, Mr. Canada. <laughs> yeah. Rush is, is big time for sure for me. Mm-hmm. Alex Lifeson. We were talking about guitarists. Yeah. I think Alex Lifeson's the most underrated guitarist that's ever lived. Isn't he, though? I, I so agree with you. I mean, he really is. Yeah. I mean, when people t- when people mention, you know, sort of the pantheon uh, of, of guitar players, he always ends up in the mix someplace, but I never think it's as high up the rank as it, as it deserves. And yeah, like, when you're in a band, with Geddy Lee and Neil Peart. I mean, what else can you do, really? Well, 
well, see, that's the whole thing. Is it's like, I mean, he really. Uh, beca- it's not even just what else can he do. I mean, the truth is, and when you you know see interviews or stuff, I mean, it, it is really how the three of them work together. I mean, there is really it, there is not one element in that band that doesn't happen without the other two elements. It, it's such a it's such an amazing synchronicity of of, of people and musicians and and creativity. Um, and that guy clearly uh, he's the comedic nutbag of the three. Um, <laughs> did you see the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame speech oh, yes. that he did? Blah blah <laughs> blah blah blah. I didn't get that. I was I was kind of weirded out by that, but it's like okay, you're Alex Lapes and you can get away with it. Here's the whole thing. I got <laughs> the first time I watched it, I definitely did it with sort of like, you know, the the, the dog staring in, in, in the headlights, sort of head cocked on one side going, wait a minute, what? So I watched it again and I started going, oh, wait a minute, I get this. And I give the guy credit because he actually did something that was like, you know what? It actually took the second and third time for me to really get it. I'm like, that guy, I mean, once again, as as a member of a band like Rush, he made you oh dig God. deep to go find what, what, it, what it was really about. And now I can watch it and I laugh hysterically. Mother? Movie. <laughs> I, mean, I just I just watched the performances, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I did I did like the uh, with Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins. Their, their oh, yeah. speech was amazing, and uh, they played Twenty One Twelve and everything. That was cool. That whole thing uh, dressed up like uh, uh, from the from the Twenty One Twelve cover of the record. That was just, I just sat there going, oh my god, so good. And 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 they did it so well too. That's the other thing. I mean, because you, you get a band like Foo Fighters, and those guys when they can play and they can sing and they can actually pull it off and. And, and I thought they did it admirably. It was, yeah, uh, for sure. I, 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 they did better than I expected. I really wanted a Canadian to induct them. Uh huh. Just because of the whole patriotic thing. Sure. With Rush. So. But, let, uh, <laughs> so I guess let, that worked out. No, I mean I thought it worked out great. But um, so let's talk about. Uh, there's two other Canadian bands that I actually uh, love a great deal. Uh, Triumph. Triumph. Yeah. I was thinking Triumph. <laughs> yeah. You I know? am a big fan. I actually did a present on Triumph for school. And really? Just did a huge research paper, so I got Triumph fresh in my mind right now. No, I Big think time. they were, in fact, I saw them, uh, I saw them play, I think it was on the, um, God, what tour was it? Um, oh my God, I'm completely drawing a blank. Um, Allied Forces? There you go, thank you. I saw the Allied for- Forces tour, and oh my God, just, I mean, how phenomenal. Um, and I never, I, they always, I mean, they hit a certain level in the States, but it never sort of hung on. I mean, they actually got to, they, they played the Us Festival on the same show with uh, with Van Halen and Motley Crue and Judas Priest and everything. The Scorpions. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, uh, that, for sure. And, um, any, any knowledge of uh, um, what those guys are up to, where they're at? Well, actually, I met Rick Emmett, the lead singer, the guy who sings, yeah. plays guitar. And I met him this summer and really? he tours solo. Yeah, I met him at a at a concert in Peterborough called Peterborough Music Fest. Got a few pictures with him and uh, talked a little bit with my band that was I was in. And he also teaches songwriting and music business at Humber College in Toronto. And then the drummer Gil Moore runs a studio in Mississauga, which is right beside Toronto, just mm-hmm. west of Toronto, called Metalworks, and it's the biggest studio in all of Ontario. Uh, big artists have been in there, like Drake, Christina Aguilera, Guns N' Roses, a uh, bunch more, and like Tina Turner. And uh, so he runs that. He keeps busy there. So they do their other things. But they did reunite once. I know it was twice in 2008. And they played, uh, they played Sweden. They played a festival in Sweden and then a festival in Oklahoma. And that was it. They were pretty big in Sweden. Like they had, a, they have a huge fan base in Sweden. That was one of the big ones. So yeah, I don't know if they're gonna play again, but would love to see them. I mean, what a power trio they were. I mean, it, it, in, <laughs> no, I was just saying, I, they were. They're, they're, I thought. That, I mean, they were incredible. And yeah, I mean, they were uh, the, the very definition uh, of a power trio. Um, three guys. I mean, in the same way that, that that Rush is, it's like, okay, wait a minute. There's three guys up there. Where is all this music coming? from and it's like well it's coming out of these three guys and the the strength and power of it and great songwriting too and I mean above and beyond just the musicianship of it uh, just a lot of heart and a lot of feel behind it
it. And and yeah, I, the lyrics, the yeah. lyrics too. I love lyrics. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead and listen to "Fight the Good Fight" and don't feel like getting up and waving a flag and kicking somebody's <laughs> ass or something. Go and try it. I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, it's it's amazing. And never surrender is uh-huh. also, also another one like that. Um, obviously, big lay it on the lion fan. Yep. Yep. Hold on. And yeah, then, they, they did a lot of good stuff. And then just for sheer, uh, the, um, the amazing Rick Emmett showing his 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 guitar prowess. You know, on, on the guitar breakdown on Rock and Roll Machine, which was, yeah. I mean, he was really doing that in a time where there was a lot of guys that were doing. Sure, there was a lot of guitar shredding that was really just starting to come out, but. Rick Emmett still had this very um, a much a much more purist um I wouldn't say bluesy, but there was a jazzy element to it. Yes, yeah, um, classical as well. Yeah, totally classical. And and, and like, who, who else was, other than maybe Brian Setzer, who else was playing a hollow body? No one. <laughs> Alex Lifeson. That's true. All right. That was, that was the early days, though. That was the early rush days. And he moved on to his strat. Yes. But... Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So cool. So um, let's do this. Uh, I want to play more of uh, Plaid on Flannel because I really dug that last track. Um, let's do, uh, all right, um, I know you'd mentioned Emergency, but when we were talking earlier, there was a, a, a lilt in your voice. There was a, a, a leaning towards this track, The Rambler, that I think we need to play it. So um, we're okay. going to do, uh, once again, uh, here on American Psycho, we have got Nolan Randall, and we are going to play uh, his track again the band is plat on flannel this is the track the rambler and uh let's check this out assuming the technology works the way it's supposed to 